ourselves. So today, part two, we're going to talk about shame and unworthiness, the neurobiology of some sabotage, and basically the biggest part, why people fail at success. Um, and basically, it goes to guilt, shame, and unworthiness, right? Guilt is, I made a mistake. Shame is, I am a mistake, right? And there's a big difference, right? Uh, and when someone says you should feel guilty, well, if you did something wrong, yeah, maybe you should feel guilty. But should you ever feel shame? You know, because to me, shame means I'm a mistake. It's okay to make a mistake, right? But shame is I'm the mistake, right? And if you have these, especially shame, it will stop you from feeling feeling worthy. And if you feel unworthy, that's a group, that's a big self sabotage. What we're going to work on today. So, are you worthy? And how do you feel worthy? You know, we talked about this in the one course I did about uh, why, when you look at the offspring of wealthy people or royalty, they do better. And yeah, we could e even equalizing for they may have special perks. You know, I was thinking about this. I was in a group. We were talking about the. Um, offspring of, of actors, because now we're getting multi-generational actors, right? Uh, but the ones that make it and stay, they're very talented, right? And yes, even equalizing for, you know, you know, when your dad or your mom is a big time actor and actress, that means you know other actors and actresses. But the big thing is, you know, the producers and the directors and the casting agents. Right. So that, but even when you take that out, it's like, you know, they seem to do better, you know, and even some of the sons and daughters of like, I'll use um, uh, celebrity actors and actresses, their children, not all, but most of them have a very good success ratio in fields not related to performing arts. Right. And it's just kind of interesting. Right. And again, we could see that through other things, right? Maybe it's because they feel worthy of the success, right? And, and so, you know, it's the difference between true humility and false humility, right? Uh, and again, it's the paradox of we worship confidence, but we hate arrogance. And it's a fine line. It's a fine line, but it's something we do, you know? And I said in the, last night when I was teaching, I said, well, and I always used the, I think, and it ended up being uh, Aaron Rodgers. You don't have to be a football fan, but he's the quarterback for the Packers. And they, he was on some talk show and they're talking about, yeah, last year they were thinking your career's over because you had this down year and da, 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 you know. And he's like, well, and he pointed out, well, the people writing that are doing it to, to sell things or to get clicks. It's whatever they're doing. And he goes, very calmly, he goes, but, you know, when I look at the numbers, my off year is a career year for 90% of the guys that play in the national quarterback in the National Football League. And he said it without, and the people, oh, and at first they're like, oh, that's, and then of course, they're, he's arrogant, he's confident. But is it backed in fact, right? Right? And it's one reason all these huge elite level athletes look to him to be a leader, right? So it's that paradox, we worship confidence, but we hate arrogance. There, there's a whole talk in there. I should probably, someone should do one day. Um, but can you accept, let's start looking about this feeling worthy. Can you accept and eat a gift? When someone gives you a gift, do you easily take it or do you reject it? Oh, you shouldn't have. I, you know, maybe you, you don't want it, right? Uh, or another way to look at it, are you always a giver? You'll give other people a great gift and when they give you one, you feel guilty. They shouldn't have done that, right? I don't know, but if you do that, that says a lot, right? And can you accept a compliment or will you automatically downplay your a compliment, right? Um, whether it's you, you get, you, you, you're wearing, you're wearing your favorite outfit, you, you know, you spent money on it, you pick yourself up, da, 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 da. And someone says, that looks great. Oh, this whole thing, eh, it's nothing, any, you know, instead of saying just thank you, right? I love that seminar. Thank you. Oh, well, it's nothing. I mean, you know, it's like, and that leads to downplaying your accomplishments, right? Um, 
And again, it's that fine line. You know, if you work hard, you should be able to say, worked hard. Can you celebrate it? Right. And humility is teach ability and open mind to the truth. Right. Uh, you can be good, but you can want to be better. Right. But you can say, this is good. You know, but having shame and guilt leads to unworthiness. And again, if you can't accept a compliment, if you can't accept a gift, that says a lot, right? Because it goes to your level of feeling worthy. And one of the problems of, of doing this kind of stuff is we're using a psychological term for a physical sensation. Yeah, it's a loaded word. Shame and guilt and unworthiness is a loaded word. It's cultural, you know? Um, we have shame about shame. You don't want to admit when you feel shameful, right? And it's a protective measure, right? Because in our DNA, um, we don't want to be thrown out of the group. That was death up to 10,000 years ago. That was a death, even a few, couple thousand years ago. That was a death sentence. When you got banished from the tribe, you were dead. You didn't make it very well. The other tribes would kill you or the bears, the, whatever was going on, right? So when you, it, it, it's in your DNA. But when you get to some of this, this is one of my favorite sayings. How do you describe the undescribable? Okay. If you've been through major trauma, how do you describe that when there's no words for it? Right. How do you describe it when there's no words for it? And then you try to put words to it that maybe that a, other people don't understand or it, it's just it, 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 it's fascinating. How do you describe the undescribable? You know, uh, and you hear that like I, I, when it comes to trauma, which a lot of this goes back to trauma, we'll talk about real quick. Um, they were interviewing somebody down here in Florida after one of the hurricanes and their house got blown away. I mean, it was terrible. They were in the middle of it, right? And I've been through several hurricanes, but nothing like this person. But they actually said the, the, the reporter was trying to get them to describe it. And it was a lady and she finally looked. She goes, there's no words to describe what it was like. I've never been anything through it. I had, no, she didn't say it, but I was in her mind, she probably, there's no reference to this, right? It, there's no reference to it. So how do you describe it? And if you get, if you've been through one or two, then you can begin to describe it. So how do you describe the undescribable? It's a physical sensation. But let's separate the two real quick. Guilt is, you know, healthy guilt is when you did something socially, objectively, morally wrong, and you accept the responsibility for it. And true healthy guilt is you have it even if you don't get caught, right? Everybody has guilt when they get caught, right? Where, you know, I, I remember there was a guy who was, um, he was in an NLP class. He was a lawyer. And years ago, he said, we were talking about this. And he goes, as, and he became a judge for a while, right? And he didn't like it. But he goes, the hardest thing to figure out is, was the person feeling guilty and remorseful for doing the act or getting caught, right? And he goes, you remember one time somebody had uh, turned themselves in for a, for a pretty big crime. And he went so lenient on the guy. He said, the prosecutor went nuts and everything else. And he goes, you wouldn't even have a case if this guy had to step forward and said, I did this, right? And he felt remorseful. He wanted to do penance he wanted to, to 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 make it good right as opposed to every you know and that's what he said you know every perp you could tell he was a lawyer every perp has shame and guilt when they're standing up there i think it was just mainly because they got caught you know and so it's just kind of ignorance but unhealthy guilt uh is basically when people have unreal standards right uh, and as adults we place unreal standards um, on ourselves that are basically unreachable. This is what perfectionism is. You know, when is good, good enough, right? Not that you, and again, people go, yeah, but you could be better. Yeah, but when is good, good enough, right? Super successful people can accept good is good enough and go on to the next one. You know, I usually say, I remember Stephen King being, they were asking him about it and he goes, once he writes a book, he's done with it. He won't read it. He doesn't want to, unless it goes to a movie and he's involved, he's done. 
because he goes, I'll find the flaws and want to rewrite the book. And he goes, he used to do, he still does writing classes, right? He says, he'll get these writers that have been rewriting the same goddamn book for 20 years. Fiction book. He's just write the damn thing and move on, get the next book, right? Uh, and, and, and it's about that battling perfectionism. And again, it's usually done by well-meaning parents and authority figures. You know, you could do better. You could do better, but it begins to become, you begin to feel fundamentally flawed as worthless. I did the best. Well, what happens when the best you can do is not good enough? All right? The best you can do is not good enough. What do you do? You know, and again, I think this one, even if you're not an athlete, Miss Jennifer is, but it, you, you know, it's like you could, you could do the best you can and still lose. You know, and that's where you see the elite athletes that can really do it. They go, well, you know, hey, the other team was better or the other opponent was better. I'll, I'll work to be better, but they don't internalize it like there's something wrong with me. Right. And again, you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes you always hear athletes talk about they learn more from a, a, from a loss than a victory because it points out the flaws in their game. You know? uh, and again, because you don't know what you don't know. right? And so what are some of these issues? You know, If you have this, you kind of feel hollow inside. Uh, yeah. And you see it a lot with addictions and people that do escapism things, whether it's addiction of you know alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling, food, whatever it is, uh, all of that. It's it, you hear people describe it's like they feel hollow inside. They they it's like they have an empty heart, right? And then what will begin to happen? You will self sabotage and never uh, achieve high levels, right? And again, those things are the big ones are alcohol, drugs, eating, sex toxic relationships, um, you know, it'll stop you. And it also becomes, a, it brings momentary pleasure, but it becomes a, uh, sometimes almost like an excuse. But if you have that feeling, it's like an empty heart or a hollowness inside, you know? I do know from the addiction world, you always hear people talk about addictions and they, they will tell you about the first time they had a drink if they're an alcoholic. The first time they had a really big drink of alcohol, or if it's another drug, the first time they smoked a joint or did whatever, they felt normal. Right? And that's one of the disconnects from people that don't understand addictions. They're like, what do you mean you felt normal? It's the first time in my life I felt normal. Right? Because they felt hollow inside that because they felt unworthy. Right? And the nature of the addiction fills a gap temporarily, right? But there's a neurobiology of shame and it has physiological responses that are not just very similar, they're exactly like when you have a life-threatening a life situation, right? When you're really feeling shame, you lose the ability to have voluntary behaviors, right? Everything becomes subconscious. You're in fight or flight to the nth degree. And you feel it below the diaphragm. You feel it below your diaphragm. It's a gut. It's like you've been kicked in the gut, right? And it can be real or it can be vividly imagined, shame, right? But it's a, it's a physiological, like you have a response to a, a life-threatening situation, right? And you have no defense when this happens. Uh, and basically it happens in, you see it after a traumatic experience, you know, and if it goes unregulated, if you don't work on it, as we would say, it, it, we all know it'll, it'll end up being post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Which is a physical response. It's not just psychological, you know? And they say the disconnect in trying to treat it is the medical side wants to find a goddamn drug to fix it, right? And the psychological side wants to fix it mentally. And it's, it, it may be a combination, but it's physical and mental, right? And it causes people to withdraw because you, when uh, the physiology of shame is you're pulled in, you're trying to protect yourself, right? 
And it, when it happens to children, children have no defense, no psychological, of course, no physical defense, but no psychological defense. They can't, you know, if they're four years old, they can't say, well, mom's just batshit crazy or dad's just an alcoholic. They're internalizing this, right? If I did, you always hear people come out of it, that if I did better, daddy or mommy wouldn't drink. If I did better, there would all this other, they wouldn't be getting a divorce, right? And so when you're in trauma, it, it's the physiology of, of that. And it's a painful experience and it cues in hiding and retreating because you're trying to stay alive. And it doesn't have to make sense consciously, you know? And if, if left untreated, unfixed, it leads to feeling unworthy, unworthy. And again, it goes back to people saying, no, I feel worthy. And then they'll you continue the conversation and somehow it'll come up that when someone gives them a gift, they can't accept it. Someone gives a compliment, they can't accept it. Well, then they don't feel worthy, right? Uh, they feel shame about feeling unworthy, so they're not going to admit it, right? And shame is an inner, I forget the guy that, I love the term felt sense, right? Because it's a made up word, and you love made up words. I'm in neurolinguistics, we make up words all the time. And, but it's a, it's a felt sense. It will use words like unworthy, unlovable, incompetent no value, right? And usually it's a reflection of relationship in your early develop, de developmental or impactful years or as the result of trauma, right? And so it's a felt sense. So we put words to it that may or may not really be what it is, but underneath it, it's that thing, you know? So, and so what begins to happen, is that a message you actually heard growing up that your father, mother, teacher, coach, authority figure said, or was it what you interpreted? Right? Many times it's the mislearning, that's the word I use, that we have, especially when we're a kid, right? A mom may say, eat something, uh, because people are starving to death in some place, depends, you know, Africa, China, they'll say something, right? We could just say America, but nobody wants to admit that. Uh, so people are starving. So the little kid and the mother means don't waste your food. She's not intending you got to eat everything on a plate. So heaven forbid, you know, you go to a buffet, you know, and you can't stop eating, you know. So the, you, the message was not what was intended, but it's what becomes a sense. You know, I got to eat everything. I can't leave anything, right? I can't throw food away. Is that what they really meant? You know, they might have, but we don't know, right? Uh, same with, you know, eat something, you'll feel better. People say that because a little kid, well, here, eat something, you'll feel better. Okay, because maybe they're physically sick. Fine, that's a, that's a good one. But then the kid learns that lesson deeply. So now they're 35 years old and they have a fight with their, their significant other. They feel bad. And that little voice kicks in, eat something, you'll feel better. And then they eat something and they, for momentarily they feel better. And then the other voice kicks in, you fat, disgusting pig, what is wrong with you? So then they feel bad. And then they hear, eat something, you'll feel better. And then they get stuck in the cycle, you know, that's, that's the binge cycle of anything, alcohol, food, drugs, sex, gambling. The behavior that relieves it causes it. And when you're in it, you can't get out, right? So it's just kind of interesting, it's that felt sense, right? And again, shame is experienced usually during early childhood or adulthood or during emotional trauma. It can happen at any stage of your life because, um, it, it bypasses everything. It goes right to the physiology, you know? Like that lady that was trying to describe the hurricane. There were no words to describe it. It was a physical, she was, her, she could have died. Her house blew, half her house blew away. All this other stuff was going on, you know? And we don't experience that, right? And so uh, it's that emotional trauma it can happen in adulthood, but usually it happens in childhood. And sometimes in childhood, it's, mislearning, it's misinterpreting, you know, 
not always. Sometimes parents and authority figures are just bad. But general, you know, if you give them the slack, it's like, you know, maybe they meant well, right? And it's a process. It's not necessarily insight specific. Um, where you can just point out, here's the connection to what happened in the past. It's why it comes up later, you know, um, like you can't accept a gift because you really want something and then somebody gives it to you and you go, I can't accept that. And you won't take it, okay? And you, there's, in your brain, if there's something going on, but you can't connect it, it could be every time as a little kid, you wanted something, your mom or dad might've said, you don't deserve that. You know, you're in line at a grocery store. You see people do it at a grocery you know, store. The kid, eh, what's it? No, you don't deserve that. Why should I get you that? Right? And the kid cries or whatever. And so it's an unconscious process, right? And it begins to develop, right? And what you see in shame is a very specific body posture. It's an autonomic pattern, which is similar. It's not similar. It is almost identical to what we see in trauma, right? So when you have this kind of shutdown feeling and you kind of tighten up, generally other people want to give you love, but it's the wrong response, right? And as I get in arguments with people about this one, I think it's funny, uh, but love, if you're, not, if you're feeling shameful, um, you don't deserve it. It'll make you feel worse. Right, that's what begins to happen. It's like you know, you like oh, you know, and then they then people they're trying to love you, they're trying to nurture you, and, and that and and it just doesn't work. It it gives an it's a paradoxical response, right? Um, and when someone's in a posture of shame, it it'll continue until they change the posture, because our you know, as our dear friend Tony Robbins would say, it's all connected. Right? If you change your physiology, it begins to change the internal state. I wish I should have put up the NLP thing of internal state, internal response, and um, external behavior. So if you change the external behavior, throw your shoulders back, pull butt, you know, uh, it changes the physio physiological response. And it, and it, and it, the good one is by throwing your, when you're like this, you're protecting your, basically your, your vital organs. So you're all like this, you're, you're a coward. You throw your shoulders back, you throw everything up, changes your physiology, and it actually opens up your heart. You're into chakras and energy, you know, it actually opens it up, right? right? Which is very vulnerable if you're feeling bad, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and basically shame, begins to make its own belief system, you know? And self-blame happens in chronic, in, in trauma. I, I, and society piles it on. Society piles it on, does it not, right? How many times someone goes through a violent crime, well, why were you there? You know, a woman gets raped, what were you wearing? What the hell's I got to do with anything, you know? But, you know, um, but it, it becomes self-blame, right? I, and then even to the point of su survival, you know, you make it through a, a combat mission and a lot of the people don't, you begin to, why did I make it? And they didn't, right? And it leads to self-loathing and, you know, and it becomes an issue in chronic, chronic trauma. And it's basically the relationship you have with your inner self. And it's survival. It's about separation. And what we have to begin to do is separate, if someone else is going through it or ourselves, we have to separate who they are right now and who they had to be to survive a trauma. And again, trauma is, is, a, is a sliding term, right? Because we always think of combat, car accidents, violent crime, da, 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 da. It could be you get ignored by your parents, right? And every, oh, that's nothing. Well, to that kid, it's everything. Might not have affected you, 
right? But it affected them, right? And we can rescript the event, right? See it through new eyes. That's what reparenting is, changing personal history. All those things begin to do that. Does this make sense? Everybody? I can see it there, okay. All right? And it can, and here's a big one. It can develop through the absence of good, not just the presence of bad or trauma. You're not, you don't get the good response. You don't get the love. You don't get the nurturing. You don't get the stuff you need, especially as a little kid. God, I sound Freudian here. But you're not getting it as a kid. That's the absence of good. It's not that your parents were beating you or necessarily abusing you. You ate, you had a good, you know, and then you feel guilty because you look back, it's like, well, we never really were hungry. We're this and that, but there was no love from self-internalizing. And again, it, it can happen where uh, it's an ex experience that people have that's meant to motivate them. You could do better, little Johnny or Gina or Jennifer or Michelle. You could do better and to change them in a positive way, but it, it ends up causing more problems, you know? So we have to reprogram our subconscious mind, right? But the interesting thing, whenever all of us talk about this, if it's an unconscious pattern, you don't know you're in it. Usually you know you're in it after you've blown something up, after you've cheated on your diet, after you've, whatever it is, then you go, hmm, whoops, what was that um, Britney Spears song? Whoops, I did it again, or whatever that, so I should play that song right now, right? It's like, you know it, at, usually after it's over or almost over, right? And if you keep working on it, then you usually catch it in the middle of the process, right? And if you really become more aware, enlightened, you kind of know it right before you go into the pattern. But again, if it's a subconscious pattern, you're not conscious, right? That's why people say, didn't you see what you were doing? No, they really didn't, right? So you have to change your mind to change your life, right? And part of that, is, um, excuse me, we have to redo your energy system, right? It's actually in your energy system as much as your psychological system, right? Because you have almost, what is it, like 60% as many neurons in your gut and, and around your heart down in here as you do in your brain. It's like, you know, the, I remember, I think it was a book, if anybody finds it, let me know, it was like of two minds and the difference between the gut and the brain and how they can operate. That's why, and that's what the, uh, um, the, the, the just escape, I would call it like a polarity response, you know, that you know you should do something, but you can't do it because it's the different responses. Um, so anyway, that's it. Good luck. Go change it. Bye. See ya. <laughs> I'm good, you know. I'm a, I'm a government consultant. I'll point out all the problems. Won't you give you a solution? Then I'll just get my check and go home. <laughs> but the guys that are really studying trauma, um, you know, with the, um, now, of course, the names just fell out of my head. But, you know, they do think the two big things, and even though they're clinically trained uh, psychologists or psychiatrists, um, they, they have a tendency to fall into with, they either do EMDR, you know, move your eyes around because it scatters the neurons in your brain, or they do EFT. Macarena, tough crowd, um, right? Because it starts to clear the energy system, right? And when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, before you do like a hypnotic technique or an NLP technique, if you could clear the energy system, it seems to work better, right? Because again, sometimes what you, I think what we see happen, it's a hallucination, but it kind of makes sense, is if you have all this energy stuff, especially down in your gut, down in here, and we do an elegant NLP technique, it can change your mind, but it may not get down to the gut level yet, right? And so, what if you kind of clear out the energy system first, 
then do a NLP technique or a hypnosis technique or therapy even, right? Because you've cleared some of the energy, all right? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> so, what time is it? Oh, we got time. You want to do a fun technique? I have a I question have very quickly. Something. Sure. Um, what, what was, was that, that you said, said the, the behavior, behavior that leads, leads and I just stopped, stopped right, right there because I, I didn't, didn't get, it. get it. The behavior that causes the guilt is the only behavior you know that relieves it. I feel guilty okay. for drinking, but drinking is the only way I know how to feel better. Or food, or sex, or gambling, or whatever it is. You know, okay. especially if it's an addiction type thing, right? You need different coping mechanisms, as they would say in clinical psych, you know? You know, well, you should just get high on life. Yeah, tell that to a heroin addict, right? Yeah, good luck with that one, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, so, all right. So I'm just going to do a general one. It's a lot of fun, right? And just roll with me. And then I'll explain why I'm doing it afterward. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Okay. I don't even know why I had my headphones on. I had the other mic and speaker on. I, I, you know, I never never claimed I was smart. Uh, I'm educated beyond my intelligence, but that happened in the first grade, I think. All right. So <laughs> here we go. Let's do the. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar with EFT, just follow what I'm doing. It's pretty easy. Um, and let's go. So take your hand, either right hand or left hand. What you're gonna do is tap on the very top of your head or the crown chakra, if you're into that, and begin to tap. And I want you to say, just do this. Um, I, I totally, uh, I feel unworthy. I am unworthy. I'm undeserving. I'm not good enough. All right. Basically, I'm unlovable. You could also say that. I'm unlovable. I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. All right. And then take your two fingers like you like this. And you're going to tap on this spot. But if you want to make it more powerful, cross your hands. Right. So you're tapping like that. And then say, I'm unlovable. I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. All right. Take a few deep breaths and just keep saying it. And then tap on the side of the eyes like that with your hands crossed. Still more powerful. I'm unworthy. No. And then under your cheeks. And then under your nose, that little spot. I'm unworthy. I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. Right. And then right in your chin. Right, I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, I'm not good. And then cross your, I always cross my hands, but tap in these spots, okay? And tap here and keep thinking, I'm unworthy, unlovable, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough. Right? In case you wonder why we're doing it, people, instead of the opposite, the theory is by doing it this way, you're blowing, you're, you're blowing it out of your system. And then between the ring and little finger, that little spot, tap right there. And now as we're doing this, keep thinking, I'm unlovable, I'm unworthy, I'm not good enough. And we're gonna move our eyes around, kind of like you do an EMDR. So kind of look up to the left, now look down to the right, now look up to the left, look down to the right, kind of make X's with your eyes, like boom, boom. And then like infinity signs with a big circle. Look all the way to the left, all the way to the right, as you keep thinking, I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough. I'm unworthy, I'm not loved. Just make exits, just bounce your eyes all around, right? And imagine it's kind of blowing all the stuff out of your system. Good, good. Now relax. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think of three things. I did this last night, a couple of you were on. Think of three things of successes in your life. 
graduating college, the day you got, whatever it is, could be anything. It's your personal success, right? And again, I'd always say I've done some, I've been blessed, but first thing always pops up in my mind is I made the football team. Not getting a doctorate, you know, not um, anything like that. It was, uh, uh, it was making the football team. And I've got some others, boot camp, and then other things. So whatever your successes are, just pick three and think about your success, about how old you were. And that's all we're going to do. Just think of three successes, right? And just give it a name so your brain can find it. Your brain can find this stuff. Great. Now what I want you to do is think of three times in your life where you made a mistake. Things didn't work out. You honestly made a mistake, but you learned from it and you didn't repeat the mistake. Right? And what did you learn from it? You know? Okay, cool. You know? Um, I, I could say my first marriage. Right? I always use that one. You know? I learned from it. I learned I like being married. I had selection errors, as I would say. And not that she's a great lady. You know, I wish you the best, you know, mother of my daughter. Uh, it's just, you know. So anyway, so what's three learning experiences? Great, so you have three successes, three learning experiences. Now we're gonna do this really cool technique. So take a deep breath, close your eyes. And I want you to just imagine you're sitting there safe and secure. And see yourself there, sitting where you are. You know, Pennsylvania, New York, Oregon, wherever you are and you're safe and secure. And now imagine your consciousness drifting up and you see yourself as you are. And it's kind of like you drained out some of the negative energy when we were doing that tapping thing. You drained out some of that negative energy, right? So you're kind of open. So let's reprogram our mind. So what I want you to do is drift back to your past, wherever your past is, and step into one of those successes that you thought of. And as you settle into it, see it, hear it, feel it, smell it, taste it, touch it, remember what that success was like. And, and maybe you had to really work hard for it. Maybe it was just easy and natural, but you had a huge success. And feel that success and accept that success. See that you there going, yes, yes, I deserve it. This was wonderful. You could celebrate that success. Right? And now drift up out of it, keeping some of those feelings and being attached to it. I always use a bungee cord. You could use a bungee cord, a rubber band, so that you're connected to it. Now go to another success that you had. And it could be in something different. And settle into it and see it, hear it, feel it, smell it, taste it, touch it, make it real. This is a big success. And you can celebrate it. You can, you can just celebrate in it. Revel in it. Yeah. And funny, from up here, that you experiencing it as you settle into it has no guilt, no shame, no remorse about being successful. Yes. And then drift up out of it, again, connected to it by a bungee cord. And go to the third ex successful experience you had. And maybe one will pop into your mind that you weren't expecting. And just experience that success. See it, hear it, feel it, smell it, taste it, touch it, yeah. And now drift up out of it, connect it to it. And now go to one of the learning experiences. But this time, it's like that you there drained away. Maybe you went through the EFT technique we just did. That you down there has no, no con energy connection to the emotion of it. That you there only remembers what you learned. Right? And just took it as a, you know, as Milton Erickson said, there's no failure, only feedback. Well, I learned something out of that. You know? Great. And then drift over to another one. And again, it's like that you there goes through and drains off the negativity, keeps the learning. And go to the third one, and the same thing happens instantly. That's right. Yeah. 
And now come back to now and settle in. And now when you look back to your past, all you see are those big successes. Boom, 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 boom. Right? And they're being pulled toward you. You feel those feelings. And then, yes, you had learning experiences. So when you look to your future, you see future successes. So you're being pulled toward your future success. Right? Great. And just settle in, take all of this in. Now open your eyes and come on back. Now what I'd like you to do is you got some homework before next week, which is think about a goal you're working on that you haven't been able to get. Since this is about self-sabotage, what is something in your life, maybe you've sabotaged your, your life in the past, right? Whatever it is, right? Pick a goal, just one, right? Could be a physical goal, an emotional goal, a financial goal, a, a, a relationship goal, professional goal, whatever it is. And I want you to begin to develop a power statement for it. A power statement, right? And it's got to be powerful. And I can give you one I'm working on, you know? And and because all I want you to do is come up with it, but it's got to be able to roll off your tongue, right? And keep it short. You're not writing war and peace here. Don't make it a big dissertation, Miss Michelle, right? It's keep it short, right? Uh, Mine currently, what I'm working on is I'm a relentless, successful, professional athlete. I'm a relentless, successful, professional athlete. And those words mean something to me, right? Relentless means I keep going, right? Um, successful means I'm, I'm doing it for a living. I'm not just doing it. You can be a, you can be a good act to me, you know. Or professional, I mean, is you're getting paid for it. You can be a great actor and do community theater, right? But if you're a professional, it means, hey, I do this for a living, right? And successful means, to me, success, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's smaller roles, bigger roles, bigger roles, bigger roles, bigger roles, bigger roles right? You know? So I'm a, I'm a relentless, successful, professional actor, right? That's it. That's my statement. So that's what I want. I want you to come up with yours for what it, whatever the goal is you're working on right now, right? So what is it? I don't know. We'll work on that next week. Cool. Let me stop the recording. Do, 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 do.